Giving is our opportunity to show God that He is first in our lives and as a reminder that God is the supplier of everything we have. It is also God's personal invitation to an outpouring of His blessing in our lives. At Christ Church, there are two easy ways to give online. First, you can text CC Mason to 77977. Click on the link you receive. You can also find this link by going to our website, ourchristchurch.com, and click on the Give button at the top of the page. Both of these options will send you to a page where you can set up a one-time gift or a recurring gift. Simply fill out your information and submit your gift. Giving is our opportunity to show God that He is first in our lives and as a reminder that God is the supplier of everything we have. It is also God's personal invitation to an outpouring of His blessing in our lives. At Christ Church, there are two easy ways to give online. First, you can text CC Mason to 77977. Click on the link you receive. You can also find this link by going to our website, ourchristchurch.com, and click on the Give button at the top of the page. Both of these options will send you to a page where you can set up a one-time gift or a recurring gift. Simply fill out your information and submit your gift. Giving is our opportunity to show God that He is first in our lives and as a reminder that God is the supplier of everything we have. 
It is also God's personal invitation to an outpouring of His blessing in our lives. At Christ Church, there are two easy ways to give online. First, you can text CC Mason to 77977. Click on the link you receive. You can also find this link by going to our website, ourchristchurch.com, and click on the Give button at the top of the page. Both of these options will send you to a page where you can set up a one-time gift or a recurring gift. Simply fill out your information and submit your gift. Giving is our opportunity to show God that He is first in our lives and as a reminder that God is the supplier of everything we have. It is also God's personal invitation to an outpouring of His blessing in our lives. At Christ Church, there are two easy ways to give online. First, you can text CC Mason to 77977. Click on the link you receive. You can also find this link by going to our website, ourchristchurch.com, and click on the Give button at the top of the page. Both of these options will send you to a page where you can set up a one-time gift or a recurring gift. Simply fill out your information and submit your gift. checked out our CC Live YouTube channel? It's the place to find all past sermons, as well as living room sessions, podcasts, CC Kids, 
and CC students content. You can even use the search feature to look for specific videos on topics like marriage, finances, fear, heaven, parenting, baptism, and much more. Check it out today. And while you're there, make sure to subscribe. Ready to have some fun and learn something new? Join us now for CC Kids Online. Community begins now. Welcome to CC Kids Live. My name is Miss Heather. Good morning. My name is Miss Sean, and we are so glad that you have joined us here today. We are starting a new series today about a man from the Bible named Moses. We are going to learn about some of the important things that happened in his life and how God was with him through it all. So today, we're going to focus on the fact that even though things are out of our control, we can put our trust in God 
Even when we don't know what's going to happen, we can take comfort in knowing that God is in control. Now we are going to watch our Bible story about when Moses was a baby. Stories of the Bible, Baby Moses. This is Moses. Hey Moses was a descendant of Joseph's brother Levi. Hey. Joseph and his brothers had many children and grandchildren who lived happily in Egypt. Eventually, a new pharaoh came to power who knew nothing of Joseph or what he had done. This pharaoh feared the Israelites because there was a great number of them living in Egypt, so he wanted to put a stop to their prosperity. Pharaoh made the Israelites slaves. He made them work long, hard hours building up Egyptian cities. But his plan didn't work, and the Israelites grew more in number and in strength. Eek. So Pharaoh made a rule that no Israelite boy would be allowed to live in Egypt. This is where Moses' story begins. You see, when Moses was born, his mother saw that he was a special baby. Hmm. And she kept him hidden for three months. But when she could no longer keep him a secret, she made a basket and put him in the Nile River among the reeds. Moses' sister stayed to watch what would happen to her baby brother. And soon the Pharaoh's daughter came to the edge of the river. When she saw the basket, hey. she sent her servant to get it. When she saw the baby, she felt sorry for him, uh -huh. thinking he must be an Israelite baby who wasn't supposed to live. Then Moses' sister asked the princess if she would like her to find an Israelite woman to take care of the baby. Uh -huh. So Moses' sister went and got her mother. Moses' own mother took care of him until he was old enough to live in the Pharaoh's house, where the princess adopted him as her son. And so, Moses, an Israelite boy who wasn't supposed to live, became the adopted grandson of the Pharaoh and lived in the palace as God prepared him for a great destiny that was only just starting to unfold. What a great story! Even as a baby, God had an amazing plan for Moses. God protected baby Moses through the entire Bible story. Now let's learn more about how we can put our trust in God when we feel like things are out of control by hearing from a new friend. Her name is Caroline. What's up everybody? My name is Caroline and this is Rewind. Rewind is a show where we compile the best videos that YouTube has to offer and show them to you, our loyal viewers. Why? Because sharing is caring and I care. Oh, I care. So let's get started. Today, I'm gonna to be playing a game called Out of Control. Oh, mm. I'm gonna be playing a game called Out of Control, LOL. Oh my goodness, this is like I'm gonna be playing a game called Out of Control, LOL. <laughs> Today, we have five videos on deck, and I will subject my eyes to five of the supposedly most out of control videos online and rate them on my out of control LOL meter. Measuring each on a scale of one to five, depending on how absolutely insane they are. One, not so crazy. Five, super crazy, my mind is going to explode. So let's get started. Video number one. What is that? Is that a horse? Is he chasing this horse? How did this horse get out? Okay, he's got it, he's speeding up, get to him. Okay, we got him, we got him. Oh. We don't got him. We don't got him. Why are we stopping him? Why are we? You're so close. Just grab it. Horse secure. Yes. Mission complete. Wow. I'm pretty sure that's the first high speed scooter horse chase I've seen before. And I liked it. But I think on the out of control little meter, I'm going to have to give him a two. 
I know it seems a little low, but hey, I can't give the first video a five. That's crazy. Next video, video number two. What are you throwing in your washing machine? Why would you do that? Also, what is he wearing? <laughs> oh my gosh, you turned it on? It's falling apart. Dude, turn it off. <laughs> what? This thing is out of control. This has gotta be it, right? <laughs> are you joking? This thing is literally walking itself across the yard. That was pretty out of control. I'm gonna have to give that a four on the out of control a little meter. All right, next video, video number three. Oh my goodness, that dinosaur's moving. Oh, oh my goodness, that kid is so fearless. That mom is so trusting. I would have ran by now. Are you kidding? Oh my goodness. Okay. on the pedal. Who let this little girl on a go kart? Oh! That kid's face with the dinosaur was priceless. Don't eat me, don't eat me. Oh. I mean, they were sort of crazy, but not really. So I'm gonna have to give it a two on the out of control little meter. Let's go with the next video. Video number four. Oh my goodness. Whoa, 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 whoa. I would leave immediately. Dude, that was crazy. I've always wanted to do that at Disneyland. That was pretty out of control. So I'm gonna have to give it a four on the out of control over there. Now time for the fifth and final video. Let's do this. Next video, please. Video number five. Okay, they're rescuing someone in a helicopter. Okay, we're doing great. Pulling her up to the helicopter. Oh, easy. She's swinging a little bit. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness, this gurney is getting out of control. Hold on. Oh my goodness. Do you see how fast the thing's going? One, two, three, four, five. Whoa. 28, 79. Whoa. Just one second. I'm good. I'm just getting sick looking at that video. That was pretty insane and definitely the definition of out of control. So I'm gonna have to give it a five on the out of control one. That's right, video number five is the winner. That rescue basket the person was in was probably spinning like at least a hundred times. Hey, you know that rescue basket reminds me of another time that a basket was out of control. But instead of being spun a hundred times a minute, this basket had a baby inside and was floating down a river full of crocodiles. It's not a video that we can watch, but it might sound familiar to some of you. That's because it's from the story of Moses in the Bible. When you think of Moses, you might imagine an old guy with a big beard standing on a mountain holding the Ten Commandments. And you'd be right. But before all of that, Moses was a kid. And from the very beginning, God had a plan for his life. Moses and his family were descendants of Jacob living in Egypt. By this time, there were so many Israelites living in that land that it was starting to get pretty crowded. Pharaoh, the leader of Egypt, was afraid that the Israelites would outnumber the Egyptians and grow too powerful. So he ordered that all the Israelite baby boys be put to death. That's right. Crocodiles aren't the only crazy part of this story. Moses' mother couldn't bear to lose her son, so before the Egyptian soldiers arrived, she placed Moses into a basket raft and floated him down the Nile River. This was incredibly dangerous, but she trusted that God would protect him. As the basket floated down the river, Moses' mother sent his sister Miriam to watch and see what happened. Further down the river, Moses was found in the basket by Pharaoh's very own daughter. Isn't that crazy? Moses was discovered by the daughter of the very man who ordered Moses and all the other babies be put to death. In that moment, Pharaoh's daughter decided to raise Moses as her own, but she was going to need some help. When Pharaoh's daughter saw Miriam, she ordered Miriam to go and find an Israelite woman to help raise Moses. And who did Miriam choose for the job? Moses' mother. I know I keep saying this, but that's crazy. From the very start of his life, Moses' journey was shaped by trusting God. His story shows us that life can get pretty unpredictable, but no matter how out of control life might seem, God still has a plan. Sometimes life's craziness can be pretty funny, but other times some of life's turns can be pretty scary. For some of us, it might mean moving to a new part of the country or a family member getting sick. For others, it might be an argument between parents or losing a friendship. No matter what the uncertainties, they can make us feel like we're losing control. But that helplessness is the perfect reminder 
that we need to rely on God. He is the opposite of out of control. We see Moses' mother trusted God. Rather than given to her fear, she decided to trust God with the life of her son. And we see how God rewarded her trust by protecting Moses when he was a child. Not only did God protect Moses, but also worked it out so his mother would remain a part of his life. God is always in control, and he has a plan for each and every one of us. But most importantly, he loves each and every one of us. God doesn't want to see us worry, but that doesn't mean scary things will never happen to us. In life, nothing is certain, except for one thing, God. His love for us is unconditional, and his plan for our lives is foolproof. So if there's a time in the next week, month, or year where you feel like everything's out of control, remember to place your trust in God. No matter how out of control life gets, he will never let you down. All right, guys, we're just about done here. We'll catch you back here next week for another episode of Rewind. What a great video. Just like Caroline said, the uncertainties we may face in life can make us feel like we're losing control, but that helplessness is the perfect reminder that we need to rely on God. That's right. We can take comfort in knowing that God is always in control and He has a plan for each and every one of us. God is with us and He loves us. Thanks so much for joining us today on CC Live. Bye. Bye. Alrighty, what is happening, CC students? So glad you guys are tuning in to CC Live and checking out as we start a brand new series. But what you need to know, summer is here. It has arrived. I've never been more excited for what's to come. I mean, summer's not having a worry in the world, not a care in the sky, late mornings, late nights, times at the pool getting sunburned along the way. I mean, there is nothing like some good relaxation and time away in the summer. And I don't know about what that would look like specifically for you, but summer for me meant uh, a lot of two-day soccer practices and or band camp. Uh, and band camp was honestly, it was equally the worst and the best memories of my life. And go ahead, get all your band camp jokes out like go ahead and say them ha 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 so funny but a lot of hand camp was hanging out with friends and there was one time at lunch that we were all hanging out together that i specifically remember and these people they were my friends and we were at our normal spot and now something to know about my friends that they were pretty ruthless i mean they were quick to put other people down and they weren't really christians but they kind of were it's hard to explain but if you weren't in their group too, you, you were on the outside looking in. So I, I wanted to be hanging out with them. So we were at lunch and I remember they were all cussing up a storm, being really mean to one another and other people around them. And I can honestly say, I started feeling pressure to start making fun of people uh, that were around us as well. But I wasn't gonna be able to, I wasn't gonna cuss. And I remember clear as day, one of the guys stopping me after I said like one of my Christian phrases of like, gosh darn it, or dang it, or you know, one of those things. He said, Cody, are you like too good to cuss? I was like, oh no, I, I just don't want to. And he was like, oh, so you're like too good for uh, like uh, to be a Christian. Like, aren't you? Like you're, you're just too good for us. And I got really embarrassed. And they all kept pushing and pressuring me to which I eventually decided to cuss and, and make fun of a bunch of people around them just to simply fit in, to be a part of that group. And it's kind of crazy, but that's the most backlash I faced as a Christian. That that today in America's persecution, like that's what it looks like, is, is being peer pressured and maybe bullying and doing things that you're not supposed to do. And it's really two things that everyone faces. And to me, that's when it got the worst. But think back to the early Christians. Persecution is really all they faced. But instead of peer pressure and bullying, it was crucifixion and stoning. One of the main guys that take up the title as killer of Christians was a guy named Paul. And Paul was known as Saul at the time. And he was a Pharisee of the Jewish faith. Paul had absolutely no belief in Jesus being the Messiah. And in fact, he was so adamant against it 
that he was willing to kill anyone who admitted that Jesus was the Son of God, Christians or Jews alike. And so Paul was the Jew who was a believer in his faith in the study of the word. He was actually really strict to the Jewish law and even called himself the Pharisee of his time. I mean, like he was like a legend of the Jews. And Paul was willing to take part in the approval of killing, torturing, and imprisonment of literally hundreds of Christians. So Paul started this in Jerusalem, and there he would travel from city to city, synagogue to synagogue, trying to find those who claimed that the resurrection was true, trying to find those that claimed that Jesus was real. So Paul can be seen in Acts in the killing of Christians, and it's here where we actually get to see his name be mentioned for the first time. So if you turn to me, Acts 7, and you open up your Bibles to there, that's where we're going to be reading. And to understand this persecution, we need to read the actual stir- story of persecution taking place. That's super important. So we've got to start at verse 54. So when the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious and they gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this, they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man a young man named Saul. And while they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and he cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. We started chapter eight where it says, and Saul approved of their killing him. You see, Saul being the Pharisee he was, wasn't going to stand by and listen to Stephen share the gospel. Surely, Paul had to be the Jew in this moment that would end the uh, the Christian movement. And so Stephen fell victim to the wrath and anger that Paul felt towards Christians. Paul's irredeemable. Paul's a murderer. He's a snake. He doesn't have faith in Jesus. He has an ego that is so big, it's literally killing so many other people. But Paul had other options. He, he, he could have just continued to study the word. He could have continued to be a good Pharisee. He could have practiced his Hebrew. He could have lived his life. But no, at a young, influential age that Paul was, he decided that he, the best way he could do it was persecute Christians. At this point, I've always wondered, what did Paul feel? Do you think he felt a sense of accomplishment that he was doing God's work as a Jew? Maybe satisfaction in continuing the purity of the Jews? Do you think he felt any guilt? Do you think he felt any remorse for Stephen and the countless other Christians who were beat, jailed, and killed? At this point in the story, we can easily say God doesn't want him. God doesn't want Paul. That has to be true. But what if I told you that God had huge plans for a killer? That Paul the Jew would go on to be one of the most influential Christians ever, period. You see, there's no moment in your life that God can't redeem. And if Paul could kill Christians and be forgiven, you can too. For you, I don't know where your baggage comes from and your sin that you, you bring with every day. For you, it might be intentionally lying to your parents about a secret you don't want anyone to know about. It might be completely turning your back on God at school because it's the cool thing to do. It might be doing things with your boyfriend or your girlfriend that honestly you know are wrong, but you're willing to do. It might be simply the fact of your ignorance that you have towards God. You might think, oh, I've grown up in the church and so I've been there every Sunday. I've got this God thing down. I'm 100%. I'm good. You see, no matter the moment in your life where you've messed up, God is still pursuing you you no matter the mistake you've made the lie you've told the bullying you've done god wants to use you guilt and shame have no place in the eyes of god but grace does 
And now that's something that I see worth fighting for. So how are you not going to let a moment shape your life? You see, we have a lot more of Paul's story to hit on. Uh, make sure to tune in next week as we talk a little bit more about the, the beginning of this redemption story that Paul's going to go on from being uh, Saul the Jew to Paul the Radical. And don't forget, guys, to be Jesus this week. See you guys soon. Join us now for the CC Live Experience, where community begins now. People come together, strangers, neighbors, my blood is one. Children of generations. Of every nation of kingdom come. So don't let your heart be troubled. Hold your head up high, don't fear no evil. Fix your eyes on this one truth. God is madly in love with you. So take courage, hold on.
is in his blood. Jesus, light of heaven, friend forever, his kingdom come. Hey everyone, welcome to CC Live. Joey Santos here, the online pastor here. Just want to welcome you. Thanks for coming to joining us today. We're in a global community and we do this together because we love being together in community through technology. Remember, every Sunday we want to uh, remind you about the Bible app. If you don't have it yet, we're putting a QR code there uh, here in the bottom of the screen for you to scan with your mobile device, download the Bible app, go through events, and then search for Christ Church Mason. And when you get there, scroll down all the way till you see CC Live Experience. You're going to need this information here throughout the service. You're going to use it so we can have a conversation because this is what we're all about. We're all about exchanging ideas, talking uh, with each other and having community. Remember, after the service, after the message, rather, uh, I'll be back here. And I'm going to be sharing with you communion. And we're going to learn about ways to continue to impact people's lives through technology. And we're going to have opportunity to give. So don't disconnect us after the message because we got a lot to share, a lot to do together. Uh, but we're going, to, we're going to jump right into the message here. And remember, this is CC Live. Community begins right here. Well, hey, Christ Church, week three of our series, Breaking Bad. I'm so glad you are with us this weekend. Now, I don't know about you, but there, there are times in this world where there's some laws that seem a little absurd to me. I don't know if you've ever seen this. I did a little digging this last week to see what crazy laws we have here in Ohio. So I want to take a moment and give you a little PSA service announcement just in case you're unaware of some of the laws in Ohio that you might break unintentionally. And, and I thought there were a few we need to be aware of. Here's the first one. Did you know that in the state of Ohio, it is illegal to get a fish drunk? It's illegal to get a fish drunk. <laughs> I'm not sure why that law had to be put into existence, but it's on the books. It is illegal to get a fish drunk. I don't know if that's why Billy Bass is on the wall in your uncle's living room. I don't know why it's there, but I know that that's the law. Here's another one. No one may be arrested on Sunday or on the 4th of July in the state of Ohio. So I'm guessing fair game. Sundays, you want to break a law, 4th of July, blow some things up, have at it. You won't get arrested on Sunday for it or the 4th of July. Now, you might get arrested on Monday for it, or you might get arrested on the 5th of July for it. But the law states Sunday and 4th of July. How about this one? In Bexley, Ohio... It's still illegal to install a slot machine in an outhouse. Now, I'm not sure if you're just trying to kill two birds with one stone there. I'm not sure why we're gambling in the outhouses, but it's against the law still to put a slot machine in an outhouse. Here's another one. Ladies, this is for you. You are forbidden from wearing patent leather shoes lest men see reflections of their underwear. So somewhere they put a law into place that you cannot wear patent leather shoes because men were using them as mirrors to look up ladies' dresses. Here's another one. A dog, if a dog is barking in Paulding, Ohio, I don't know why this is a law, but a policeman may bite it to quiet it. I, I, I would actually like to see the police cam footage of that. Like the, the dog's barking and the policeman comes up and he bites the dog. I'm not sure that would make the dog stop barking, uh, but that is a law. In Youngstown, Ohio, it's illegal to run out of gas and to ride on the roof of a taxi cab. Now, I'm, I'm not sure what kind of Uber experience that is where you got to get on top of the car to ride it around, but, but it's against the law. And, and then finally, the best law ever written in the state of Ohio, and it's just simply this. In Ohio, it is against the law to throw a snake at anyone. It's against the law. Now, what's funny to me is that at one point, all of these things were put into law for a reason. For some reason, they're on the books. Now, and it's also funny to me that some of these laws have never changed, and they're actually still on the books today. I mean, hey, if you throw a snake at me now, my, my worst fear on the planet, I actually can legally prosecute you, and I probably will. But the reality is these laws were put into practice at some point for good reason. 
And, and what's interesting is people were doing some really strange things, and these laws had to be put into place to remind them how to act. So today we have things like speed limits and, and laws on how to abide as good citizens and laws to help us stay safe and, and orderly. Laws are there for a reason. Now, I'm not a proponent of breaking the law, but, but I'm always asking the question of why do certain rules, why do certain, certain laws actually exist? So if they're for no good reason then I may have broken a few dumb rules in my life if they're for no good reason. My guess is you have to. However, the law is still the law, right? So what about you? Like, I'd be curious, how many of you keep the law because, well, it's the law? That you just keep the law, like you don't break the law because it's the law. Now, some of you, how many of you break some laws because you're like, that, that's a dumb law? Why would that be a law? My guess is no matter how good we think we are, we still seem to break some law sometime. So before we dig any deeper, wherever you are, if you're at the monkey bar, you're at a house campus, you're with your family in your living room, or maybe in the chat room online, I want to ask you a question. What are some stupid laws that you've broken in your life? What are some stupid laws in your mind that you've broken in your life? Now, you may think the speed limit is stupid. You, you may be thinking a stop sign in your neighborhood is stupid. Just take a few moments and discuss, have some fun with it for a minute, and we'll come back and we'll dive into the rest of our morning together.
So I, I don't know how you answer that question of what stupid laws have you broken or if you've ever broken the law. But here's what I know. None of us keep the law perfectly. In fact, you're like, I, I'm sure I'm sure I do. I don't break any laws. Well, did you also know that in Ohio, it's a law that every time you pass a car, you must honk your horn. So unless you honk your horn every time you pass a car, guess what you're doing every day? You're breaking the law. Now, you might be thinking, what does this have to do with the book of Galatians? Well, great question. Because Paul actually unpacks this law thing pretty deeply in Galatians chapter 3. So go over to Galatians chapter 3. Now, over the last few weeks, we've talked about that the, the, the checklist does not save us. That keeping all the rules don't get us into heaven. We've talked about the traditions that keep us from, from transformation in the church. We've talked about the barriers that, that keep us from the unification of the church. And then these barriers that actually build um, this, this wall around the world to keep the, the world out of being a part of the church. And today we need to unpack why the rules and why the laws exist to begin with. So let's go to chapter 3, verse 19, and we're going to pick up there. Why then was the law given, says Paul? Great question, right? Why then was the law given? It was given alongside the promise to show people their sins. But the law was designed to last only until the coming of the child who was promised. God gave his law through angels to Moses, who was a mediator between God and the people. So verse 19, Paul tells us the point of the law. He asks this question, so what's the point of the law? And here's what is interesting. It, it did not come to tell us how to be saved. That's not why the law was created. Actually, it came to tell us about our sin. That's why the law exists. The purpose of the law is to show us our problem. And our problem is that we are lawbreakers and to prove to us that we cannot be the solution to ourselves. And since we're unable to be perfect peacekeepers, perfect law keepers, that's why it came. So I want you to write something down as we, as we dig in today. And it's just this, for a promise to bring a result... It only needs to be believed. But for a law to bring a result, it has to be obeyed. That, that's what theologian Tim Keller says. I'll read it again. For a promise to bring a result, it needs only to be believed. But for the law to bring a result, it has to be obeyed. So uh, let me give this example. If I say to you that my Uncle Jimmy wants to meet you and he wants to give you $10 million. I just say he just wants to meet you and he wants to give you $10 million. The only way you could probably fail to receive the money is to fail to believe that claim. That you, you might just laugh it off and go home and you would never get the money because you didn't believe the promise. Now, if I said to you, my Uncle Jimmy, he's willing to leave you $10 million. And here's what he requires. He's gonna require that you spend the rest of his life taking care of him in his home um, into his old age. Then you have the fulfilled and required obedience and condition to get the $10 million. See, two different situations. And here's, again, the words of Keller, a gift promise needs only to be believed to be received. If you just believe he wants to meet you and give you $10 million, if he showed up, you would have given it. But a law wage must be obeyed in order to be received. So the law wage is show up, do something, get the reward. The purpose of the law is to show us that we don't just fall short of God's will, but requiring some extra effort to do better, but that we're completely under the power of sin, requiring us to be rescued. Like, like, don't miss that. The, the purpose of the law is not to show us that we just don't, like, just fall short of God's will, requiring extra effort to do better. Like, if we just do a little more, we, we can get in. But the law actually, it, it reminds us we're completely under sin's power, requiring rescue. So I want to ask you another question. And, and this one's going to dig a little deeper this morning. But ha have you seen the law, if, if you've ever been around church or ever been around the Bible or around Christians and you're not one? Have you seen the law as judgment or opportunity for rescue in your life? And then I would ask you, why do you see it that way? Let me ask it again. Have you seen the law as judgment or opportunity for rescue in your life? And why do you see it that way? Take a few minutes to discuss. We'll be right back.
So let's go to verse 20. And it says this, Now a mediator is helpful if more than one party must reach an agreement. But God, who is one, did not use a mediator when he gave his promise to Abraham. Is there a conflict then between God's law and God's promise? Absolutely not. If the law could give us new life, Paul says, we could be made right with God by obeying it. But the scriptures declare we are all prisoners of sin. So we receive God's promise of freedom only by believing in Christ Jesus. Like the law has the power to show us that we're not righteous, but it can't give us the power to be righteous. Don't miss that. The law has the power to show us that we're not righteous, but it cannot give us the power to be righteous. So ironically, if we think we can be righteous by the law, we've missed the main point of the law itself. And honestly, this is most churches and most Christians today is that we think we can be righteous by keeping the law, by holding all the rules in check. If we can do that, check the list, then we're made righteous. The law does not make us righteous. The power of Jesus is what makes us righteous. So the list does not go against our need for salvation by grace through Christ, but it supports it, pointing out our need for it. That's the law. So the law will show us how to live, but will not bring us life. In fact, write that down. The law will show us how to live, but the law will not bring us life. The law shows us the how of living, but Jesus is actually the life. In fact, Jesus says in Scripture, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He doesn't say, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except by keeping the rules and through me. He says, through me, I'm the life. The law does not bring life. It shows us how to live. Jesus shows us what it means to be life. Verse 23, before the way of faith in Christ Jesus was available to us, we were placed under guard by the law. We were kept in protective custody, so to speak, until the way of faith was revealed. Let me put it another way, says Paul. The law was our guardian until Christ came and protected us until we could be made right with God through faith. And now that the way of faith has come, we no longer need the law as our guardian. I love how theologian John Stott actually unpacks this. In fact, it's a little bit of a lengthy passage, but I just want you to hear this because I think it's so imperative. He says, after God gave the promise to Abraham, he gave the law to Moses. Why? He had to make things worse before he could make them better. The law exposed sin, provoked sin, condemned sin. The purpose of the law was to lift the lid off of man's respectability and disclose what he is really underneath. Sinful, rebellious, guilty, under the judgment of God, and helpless to save himself. And the law must still be allowed to do this and do its God-given duty today. One of the great faults of the contemporary church is the tendency to soft-pedal sin and judgment. We must never bypass the law and come straight to the gospel. To do so is to contradict the plan of God in biblical history. No man has ever appreciated the gospel, the good news, right? Until the law was first revealed to him, to himself. It's only against the inky blackness of the night sky that the stars begin to appear. And it's only against the dark background of sin and judgment that the gospel shines forth. Like, what a, what a great package, like, uh, passage. Like, law and grace, law and grace work together in Christian salvation. And now, many people want, the, like, this sense of joy and acceptance, but they don't want to admit the seriousness of their sin. They'll not listen to the law's searching and painful analysis of their lives and their hearts because we just want to feel good. But unless we see how, self, how, like, how helpless and profoundly sinful we are, Unless we understand that, the message of salvation, the good news of Jesus, will never be exhilarating or liberating if we don't understand how far we've come. So unless we know how big our debt is, we cannot have any idea how great Christ's payment was of it. I mean, think about that. The debt of our sin is so big, yet Jesus paid off our debt. That's like saying that you were millions of dollars in the hole and you're going to prison for life. And Jesus goes, I'll pay it. I'll pay it. I'll pay it for all of humanity. So if we think we're not all that bad, and I want you to write this down. If we think that we're not all that bad, the idea of grace will never change us. If we don't think we're all that bad, the idea of grace will never change us. So I want to ask another question today as we start to wrap things up, and it's just simply this. How does or could this idea of grace change you? 
How could or how does this idea of grace change you? Take a few moments and talk through this. Like really, really push into this question because some of you need to accept grace today and some of you need to remind yourself of the grace you've received. Take a few moments and we'll be right back.
So what does this mean for you today? What does this mean for you today? Because honestly, for some of you today, you need to recognize that you need God's grace. You need to see that the only way to eternity is through the one who came to fulfill that law, not abolish it. So Jesus came to make things right for you and for me. That's why he came. And for some of you, you've been keeping the law, but you've not found life. You check the list, but you don't have the Savior. The the law reminds you of your guilt and your shame if you break the law of God. So you live a life striving instead of abiding. You live this life of striving to do something, striving to be enough instead of simply abiding in Christ. By the way, we're not called to strive, we're called to abide. We're not called to strive, but uh, abide. We're called to abide in Christ. In fact, the only thing you should strive to do is to abide more into Jesus Christ, to look more like Christ, being more like Jesus. In fact, the law shows us as we really are, but the law points us to see Jesus as he really is too our Savior. Like, did you catch that? The law shows us as we really are. So the law exposes us, but the law points us to see Jesus as he really is, and that's our Savior. He's the one who obeyed the law on our behalf and that died in our place so that we might receive the promised blessing of Jesus. The law allows us to love Jesus and enables us to that love and an overwhelming joy and obedience to him. That's the beauty of the law. That's the beauty of Jesus. Like, this is why baptism is so important. By the way, it's Baptism Sunday here at Christ Church. If you're at the bar or, or you're in your living room or you're at a house campus, like, lean into this because you're not off the hook on this today. You don't have to be in our church building to get baptized. If, if you're at the bar, by the way, there's a big old river right next to it. I'm sure we figured out a way to get you in there, Right. Or if you're at your house, I I would venture to say you might have a a swimming pool or a hot tub or a bathtub that that you can find a way to be baptized. Or if you're uh, in one of our online campuses, talk to somebody in the chat room about how to go about that. But I I will continue to preach as hard as I can and, and to compel each and every person to experience baptism. Now, hear me. Baptism is not the only part of salvation. There's other pieces to that. You got to hear the word. You got to believe the word. Uh, you got to you got to repent of where you are, then be baptized, and then live fruitful lives. But can I just tell you, it's still a part of salvation. Baptism is a is a very big part of our salvation. It's not just a moment of cleaning off, but it's also a moment of putting on something new. In fact, listen to Paul to the church of Galatia. He says, "For you're all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus." And all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ like putting on new clothes. There's no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. And now that you belong to Christ, you're the true children of Abraham. You are his heirs and God's promise to Abraham belongs to you. So for some of you today, it's time to put on new clothes. For some of you today, it's time to wash off the guilt and the shame of the law that you've been living under. You recognize you can't do this on your own. You've been, you've been imprisoned by a whole lot of different things. You've been imprisoned by addiction or adultery or cheating or lying or pride or gossip or slander or division or impurity or jealousy. I mean, fill in the blank. And maybe if, if you had a shirt on when you walked in today, you, your, your number on your chest was your guilt and your shame was the law that is reminding you every day that you're not enough maybe that was you today can i just tell you you need some new clothes you need some new clothes in fact i want to ask you something and i i want you to be real honest with those around you and this is going to be a really direct question have you ever been baptized why or why not have you ever been baptized? Why or why not? Or maybe you're going to say, well, I was, I was baptized as a baby or I was sprinkled. By the way, can I just say something really quickly to that? You getting baptized as an adult does not negate what happened as a baby when you were sprinkled or you were christened. Honestly, what it does is it completes the process of what your parents started. But now you make the decision to follow Jesus by being baptized and not only washing off the old, but putting on something new. So I want you to take a minute. I want you to really discuss this with the people around you. Have you ever been baptized? Why or why not? And we'll come back and wrap this up.
See, you need some new clothes. See, when you take off the prison garb, you put on something new. You, you put on forgiven. You put on saved. You put on redeemed. See, when you're baptized, you are, you're fulfilling the law of Christ, that you, you died to the list and you put on some new clothes. You got some new digs. You got, you got some new threads. You got something that looks good, something that, that is new, that, that people are going to look and go, wait a minute, there, there's something different. You got something new on. And today I know for a fact, some of you need some new clothes. Some of you need a fresh start. I love the way the message paraphrase actually words those last couple of verses we just read. It says this, but now you've arrived at your destination. By faith in Christ, you are in direct relationship with God. Your baptism in Christ was not just washing you up for a fresh start. It also involved with dressing you in an adult faith wardrobe. Christ's life, the fulfillment of God's original promise. So I'm just, I want to compel you today. For some of you, you've been living in prison to your guilt and your shame for a long time. Maybe you walked in today and your shirt did say adulterer. It said luster. It said uh, law abider, but completely locked up. Maybe it said pride or arrogance, liar, cheater. Can I just tell you today? Your prison number does not have to define you. You can put on the new clothes of Christ. So I would compel you today, today may be the day that you need to be baptized. So if you're at the bar right now, I would encourage you talk to, talk to maybe your your rooted leader, talk to, to Joey or one of our staff down there, talk to one of the volunteers at the bar, talk to, to Mark and Amy that, that open their bar every, every Sunday for y'all to have church in. Maybe you're at a house campus right now. I would encourage you hop on and talk to somebody in chat room right now. Or, Or if you're in our chat room and you're by yourself right now and you're compelled to take off the old and put on the new, I would encourage you today to talk to someone now. Don't put off the taking off of the old and putting on of the new one more day. Jesus longs to clothe you in something new. So I'm going to pray for us and understanding that when the church learns to break the law with life, we help others live. When we learn to break the law with life, we help others live. Let's pray. Father, today, God, my prayer is today is that God, you would free us. God, that we would no longer live under the bondage of the checklist, the bondage of the law, but we would allow the law to show us how much we need you. That God, we would break the law to have life because you fulfilled it. That God, the only thing we need is you. The only thing we need to do is take off the old and put on some new clothes. God, that you would you would have those today that, I know, God, there's people watching this, people listening to this that need to be baptized, that need to die to an old self and raise new life in you. God, I pray that today um, they would experience the full immersion of dying to the self and raising to new life. God, that they would experience the new breath of coming out from under the water, knowing that they're clothed in you. God, change us, transform us, move us, unhinder us, unimprison us, and make us new, God. We love you. It's your name we pray. Amen. Eating and drinking is a parable of intimacy. Who we choose to eat and drink with reveals our loyalty. I am no expert in dining trends, but as casual observer, I notice a pattern with the rising of family-style dining. As traditional family meals uh, at home become less frequent, we look to the restaurants to provide the share plate dining experience. Eating and drinking feel communion. Many Instagram feeds remind us that solitary meals feel incomplete. So we pull our smartphones and virtually break bread with 500 other closest friends. Eating or not eating with someone makes a statement. When Joseph's brothers came to Egypt, the Egyptians thought it was shameful to eat with the Hebrews. Saul suspected that something was up in his kingdom was when David no longer ate at his table. By contrast, in a touching picture of acceptance, David invited the son of his enemies to eat at his table like a family member. We who were once God's enemies have been reconciled into his family, invited to dine with King Jesus as a reminder of our newfound intimacy with him and each other. 
As there is one loaf broken for many, we who are many are one broken in Christ. This is a glorious shared meal. We gather to eat and drink together because we are in community. Father, thank you so much for this time. And we come before you as one global community, as one church, to share this moment with you. So we bring this communion before you as we surrender our hearts and our lives completely to you today. Bless this time together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. CC Live is an online global community of Christ's Church in Mason, Ohio. By partnering with us, you are empowering and enabling not only international, but local outreach. Your financial support helps us impact people across the globe, across the country, but even across the street. The Bible calls us to be generous with what we have been given. Giving back to God reflects a grateful heart that wants to return back to God a portion of what He has given to us. Giving is our opportunity to show God that He is first in our lives and is a reminder that God is the supplier of everything we have. It is also God's personal invitation to an outpouring of His blessing in our lives. At Christ's Church, there are three easy ways to give. Scan the QR code on the screen right now you can text CC Mason to 77977 and click on the link you receive. You can also find the link to give by going to our website, ourchristschurch.com and click on the give button at the top of the page. Both of these options will send you to a page where you can set up a one-time gift or a recurring gift. Simply fill out your information and submit your gift. Thank you for partnering with us. Together community begins here. Listen, everyone, thanks so much for joining us today. So glad you were here uh, to do this together. And remember, we'll be back here next week, 9.50 a.m. Eastern Time. And we'll do this all over again. But remember, you don't have to wait until next Sunday to connect. This QR code right here, right in this corner, can give you access to everything CC Life. So make sure to use your mobile devices uh, and scan this QR code, get information, get access to your social media uh, outlets and, and our websites and areas where you can give. Uh, you can stay connected with us uh, throughout the week. But next week, we come here together as one church, as one global community to worship together and to celebrate all that God's doing in our lives throughout the week. This is CC Live Community Begins right here.
swing wide.